Welcome back to The Urban Monk, Dr. Pedram Shojai in studio. So happy to be in Southern California. I'm about to start traveling again and um, I love home. <laughs> I gotta say, it used, to, it used to have so much allure of going on these business trips and now it's just like, I wanna be home, I wanna see my kids, I wanna be in my garden. Uh, we are really working hard on finishing the post-production of the Prosperity movie. Uh, it is really coming together well as a film and we have been very busy looking at the ecosystem and the conversation around sustainability, uh, conscious capitalism, and how we can better coexist and how we can vote with our dollars and all the different kind of pieces of this narrative that I've been sharing over the last few months. Uh, with me today, uh, Kate Rayworth, who has written a book called Donut Economics. Uh, very, very well uh, spoken and positioned in this space over at Oxford, so she must be smart, right? And um, has written this book really around the principles that we have to use to really think differently uh, about economics and how we coexist together in this monetary system. Uh, I promise not to get too geeky and heady about it because this involves you and where you spend every single cent in your life and how you can make uh, choices differently to change the world. So welcome to the show. Hi. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be with you. Great to be here. We are um, uh, using Skype the way it should be used, which is bridging uh, the, the big pond and the small pond to be able to have conversations like this uh, across all ponds. And so you are a senior research associate at Oxford. You've been looking at coming up with uh, a, a new approach to sustainability leadership. What got you into this in the first place? Oh, well, I studied economics at university 25 years ago because I wanted to change the world and work on social justice and environmental integrity. And I was just deeply frustrated by what I was taught because everything that I cared about seemed to be brushed to the margins or swept over. And so I walked away from economics thinking I would immerse myself in real world challenges. I worked in the villages of Zanzibar for three years. I worked at the UN headquarters for four years. I worked with Oxfam for a decade. I became a mother of twins. And through all of these experiences, I realized that you can't walk away from economics because it frames the world we live in. It's the mother tongue of public policy. And so we need to change economics if we're going to make it fit for taking on the challenges of the 21st century. So I decided to walk back towards it, but flip it on its head and start with human well-being in the 21st century and what the heck that looks like. And by describing that, then ask ourselves, what kind of economic mindset will give us half a chance of getting there? So that's where I came to this from. Interesting. So I've been traveling the world uh, interviewing people about this concept of prosperity. And so, you know, everyone I ask, you know, what is prosperity? They have a slightly different answer, right? But, you know, there's kind of this kind of all-inclusive narrative. It's like, you know, for me, my prosperity definition includes time with my kids, time in my garden, skiing, right? And all, all the things that are included in, in what would make my life whole. And to have a triple, quadruple bottom line type of answer to that is really where most people are at in their personal sentiment. But when you talk about economics, it's just kind of, you know, this, this very cut and dry system that is so separate than us. It's, you know, top down from Wall Street or, or you know, wherever, the, wherever, you know, the, the dictum is. And it's just this kind of um, concrete structure that we can't get out of. So you're now looking at shifting that. You're looking at shifting. Yeah, shift wow. Right? Economics sounds pretty bad, right? And who'd want to have anything to do with it? And the way you described it is exactly how most of us feel about it. But economics, let's go back to the ancient Greek. Economics means household management. And when it comes to the management of our planetary household, it couldn't be more relevant. So we need to reclaim that word. I mean, I never wanted to be an economist when it was about finance and equations and obscure things. When I reframe it and think, Household management for the 21st century. I want to be part of that. I'm up mm. for that. So I believe in reclaiming it to its original meaning. And in the way I think of it, since you talk about all the different ways people talk about it, I think of it as a bean and a marble. This to me is prosperity in the 21st century. So here's a little bean. And that bean stands for meeting everybody's daily needs of food. We have needs for water, healthcare, housing, education. So prosperity lies in ensuring the health and well-being of every person. But at the same time, as we now more recently understand, it also lies in this little blue marble, which is like planet Earth. 
and it lies in the health of our whole planet. And realizing this tiny little blue marble that we live on, it's the only living planet that we know of in the universe. It's exquisite and extraordinary. And over the last 11,000 years, the stability of the earth has been so benevolent to humanity. It's allowed us to multiply and thrive. And we depend upon keeping a stable climate, ample fresh water, bountiful biodiversity, a protective ozone layer, fertile soils, all these core systems that keep Earth in this stable, benevolent state. So our well-being actually lies in both of those. We need the bean for our food, and we need to protect that little blue marble. And I turned those two ideas into a diagram, which has come to be known as the donut. Um, so it's talking about meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. And that, in my mind, is a very simple way of encapsulating human progress and well-being in the 21st century. Beautiful. So we live, especially here, I mean, you guys are going through a Brexit and we're going through our own upheaval here politically, where now we have some morons denying climate change and we have all sorts of really kind of regressive thinking that is uh, really, you know, uh, challenging your marble there. So how can we use economics as a lever to start to drive uh, better behavior, better consumption, better utilization, whatever it is, towards getting the business community, getting the, the, uh, the end user, if you will, to be supportive of the marble while supporting the bean. Like that, that's really kind of the, the question of our era to me, is how do we do this without the top-down control systems because they're corrupt and broken? Right, so just to go to those, the, the Trump situation that you're in the US, fascinating because Trump, studied economics at the Wharton School, Pennsylvania, in, 19, in the early 1960s. So I'm fascinated by the mindset that he got from that 20th century mindset that looks at, thinks the economy is the market and that it's self-contained. And what did Trump stand on a platform for election? He wanted to call 4% growth. He just talks about being pro-growth. He's actually echoing JFK who stood on an election platform for 5% growth in 1960. So I think of Trump's economics as 1960 economics. Conveniently, before Rachel Carson even wrote Silent Spring, before we understood about climate change, and that's why he needs to dismiss climate change, because it completely jars with economics that works for him in terms of thinking of growth and markets only. Mm. We need to leap away from that 1960s mentality, and those of us who want to make progress even during these tough times, have to frame it around a new vision. So for me, the new vision is purpose of the economy for household management is to meet the needs of all within the means of our planet. How do we do that? First of all, we need to understand that the economy is not just the market and it's not just the state, this 20th century boxing match between two ideologies that we've lived through. It's also the household. You talked about your kids. We begin every day in the household where we wash our clothes, feed ourselves, sweep up, clear up, raise our children, give each other love and care. That is the core economy of the household where we meet so many of wants and needs. But there's also a fourth sector, which is the commons, the place where communities get together, whether online or in the neighborhood, and self-organize to create things they value, whether it's a, a neighborhood garden or a world wide web. So we've got the market, the state, a household and the commons. And these are all ways that we provision for our wants and needs. And when I think of those four together, I find it much richer than just thinking the economy is the market and finance, because mm -hmm. it's not. It's these all these different ways. And they interact. I wouldn't want to live in an economy that was lacking any one of them. Mm -hmm. And then we can think, okay, what kind of business, which is in the market, can help us thrive in the 21st century? Some of those businesses are going to be ones that interact with the commons that build on open source platforms, for example, that put their intellectual property in a creative commons so that the ideas can be used and, and built upon. There are also going to be um, businesses that realize that we need to create an economy that's distributive by design and generative by design. I'll just say what I mean by each of those. Distributive in that the value that's created in the enterprise is shared far more widely and equitably with all of those who help to create it, whether that's through an employee owned company through putting ideas in the creative commons, through community-owned renewable energy projects, for example. And we need to be regenerative by design, ensuring that we're not using up Earth's resources, putting that pressure on the blue marble, but actually using them again and again and again, so that we become part of Earth's cyclical processes of life. We return to the cycles of life, 
rather than cutting through Earth, taking from her sources and dumping in her sinks, which is what's put so much pressure on this planet. Amen. You know, it seems in the current climate that the dogs of war are, are you know, kind of back at it. And so, you know, it's like, okay, well, that's all, that's all fair if we're talking about, you know, Western civilization. But, you know, we have big bad Putin and, and the Chinese and the North Koreans, and, and they're not playing fair. So now, you know, now we can't share IP. We have to be, you know, protective of all. It's isolationism that, that, that kind of, you know, becomes this kind of regressive uh, energy and it recoils from, from some, some of that thinking. So how do we win with that, right? How do, how do we bring the bigger thinking forth and allow that to drive the narrative and, and kind of dispel some of this fear? Mm. It's very easy to get sucked into that nation against nation language. And actually, I think that, that inter, um, geopolitical sparring can really be harnessed by government to push through an agenda that they want. I mean, in, in my own country, Mrs. Thatcher knew back in the 80s that war was the biggest excuse to push through her agenda. So if you can create an enemy or a, a, a threat outside your national borders, it somehow gives you permission to do all sorts of things in the border. So I really suspect when I hear this geopolitical rivalry between countries, and of course it's the last thing we need because Earth scientists are at the point of understanding Earth as a whole, that blue marble as a whole, we need to collaborate and listen and work together if we're going to have half a chance of protecting these life-giving systems on which we all depend. So how do you do that? I don't know how to solve the geopolitical wrangling, but I know that one powerful way of, of working against it, and it comes as an inspiration from Donella Meadows, is to speak to the narrative that you believe in, to speak in the words and the framing that inspires you, that is a positive image of the world you want to create. Because the more people who start speaking to that and making the language normal, talking about distributive and regenerative design, talking about prosperity, not growth, for example, the more we do that, we begin to create a language that people understand, that journalists might start to pick on, that politicians might even begin to use. So we create these new ideas that become normal. It's at the level of paradigm change, and it, it might sound impractical, but as Donella Meadows so beautifully said, the thing about paradigm change is it doesn't take decades. It can happen like that. The somebody gets the idea. So it's a very powerful leverage point for change. Yeah, yeah. So you have a seven-step change process that you've highlighted in your book that is part of these kind of game-changing concepts and, and the foundation of transformative change. And, you know, there's all sorts of language around there's second order change. There's lots of different ways of talking about doing this paradigm shift versus incremental change. So I would love to dive into your framework to really start to understand how we go about making this happen. Okay. So for me, the the, the change, the way I want to come about contributing to change and, and generating prosperity is through challenging the fundamental ideas that students are taught in economics. And even if you've never studied economics, don't think you're immune to it because actually it shapes the way we all think and talk about the economy from the way journalists ask questions on the news to the way politicians pose questions in Congress. So it shapes the language everybody using. And the problem is this, that the students today are going to be the policymakers and, and the citizens of 2050. But the economics they're being taught comes from the textbooks of 1950. Those in turn are based on the concepts and theory of 1850. Given the challenges we face in the 21st century, this is shaping up to be a disaster. So we need to revisit the fundamental concepts of what the economy is, what it's for, who we are in it and how it works. And that's what these seven steps in my book set out to do. So the first one is, the simplest and at the top level is to change the goal. As I said, economics means household management. So what are we trying to manage our household for? I think the last 100 years has become obsessed with managing the household for GDP growth. This is given as the de facto goal as if growth is the sign of success. And yet it's come with rising inequality in many countries and extreme environmental degradation too. So we need to reframe that and for me the goal is getting into the donut, the safe and just space for humanity where we can meet the needs of all within the means of the planet. It's a big goal, it's a long-term goal, but heck, we need the big long-term visions to guide what we're trying to do. So that's the first one. Let me let me ask you about and then that. What, Sorry, let me yeah. just, on, on the yeah. first one, the United Nations has its 17, I think, 16 or 17 kind of sustainability uh, benchmarks, and each of them are, you know, really yeah. kind of well-researched, well-developed, saying, look, 
here's where we are, here's where we need to be, here's the delta. And there seems to be, I think the, the, I've heard varying numbers, but somewhere around $6 trillion deficit in what's needed and what's funded and what needs to happen to actually execute on each of these to make it happen. Is that a framework? Does that fall within your, uh, your donut paradigm to say, look, these are the sustainability goals that we can kind of uh, really all work together on because they're well-researched and we know if we did this, it's going to get us where we need to be? Yeah, the, so the U.S. Sustainable Development Goals and the donut, I would say, are like cousin concepts. Um, I created the donut back in 2012, and it was launched and, and became very widely uh, viewed at the very same UN meeting where they said, let's create these sustainable development goals. And I was told by people who were on the inside of the UN process that in the last hours that they were hammering out text to agree these sustainable development goals, you know, when they can so easily get distracted about negotiating over a comma or changing tiny words, somebody told me there was a picture of your donut on the table almost to remind us, don't lose sight of the big vision. So the donut had to shape the sustainable development goals. I've rewritten and reframed the donut in light of the sustainable development goals, iteratively shaping each other, cool. which is really good because it's important to embrace the values of the UN. What I think the donut does that the, the sustainable development goals don't do is it bases it on the latest earth system science of understanding how much pressure we believe we can put on the planet's systems before we start to kick them out of the filter. So it brings in the reality of limits of pressure we can put on the planet. I, I think that in the sustainable development, they sort of avoided that. And one of the goals is economic growth, GDP growth. I don't think that's a goal. It might be a means in some countries, but it's not a goal. But by writing it into the set of goals, it's in a way you limit your own ability to rethink the economic system mm. if you've gone and put in growth as one of the goals. So I've taken that out and questioned instead. Interesting. Well, I mean, because the definition of growth is, is a tumor, right, within that paradigm. And so it's a cancerous growth. And if you're feeding a cancer, the rest of the cells in the system are all compromised, right? And so I, I, I agree with you on that. The, the, but so many people have so much at stake in kind of the fundamental questioning or re reinvention of this economic model that it almost seems like that was a concession uh, to, uh, you know, get governments to play along. I, I, I don't don't understand why that was there. Right. And, and when you listen to the way politicians talk about re-envisioning economies, they're all reaching for these words. They'll talk about shared growth or inclusive growth or green growth or good growth or smart growth. Add all the adjectives you like. It's always got to have growth attached to the end of it. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there's a real lock in for this desire for growth. And as you said, it becomes like a cancer. Anything that grows forever destroys itself or the system on which it depends. That's it. That's it. Okay, cool. So you are, you are uh, one of the inspirations and one of the voices in the development of those goals. I mean, there's a lot of talk around these goals, and so I just and I'll and I'll share them in the blog uh, that's associated with this, just so we can see. We'll have you know the 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 image of the donut. Um, I'll share the book with you in a minute, and then we'll also put links to that, just so my viewers and listeners can can get a better right. sense of what this kind of bigger conversation is. So, number one, change the goal. Number two, yeah. Number two, see the big picture. Let's put the economy in context. As I was describing earlier, often economists and economists tend to draw the economy as if it's just market. In fact, there's a lovely story behind it. The man who drew the picture of the economy that every student still studies today, he drew it in 1948, a guy called Paul Samuelson, and he was teaching at MIT. And he was teaching engineering students. So he drew the economy in a way they'd understand, he made it look a bit like a radiator system with tanks and water going round and round inside an enclosed system. And that water going round and round supplies money and goods going circulating around the economy. It's called the circular flow of income diagram. It's the biggest picture of the economy an economist can give you. If you say, show me the biggest picture you've got of you know the economy and what it looks like, bird's eye view. That's what they show you. It's got absolutely no mention of the living world on which all of economic goods and services are drawing and depending. It's got no mention of the work of parents creating labor, this, this worker who appears fresh and ready for work every day. It's got no mention of the creative commons in which we do so many dynamic things. So it's completely narrow view of the economy, but it still frames the way so many economists think about the economy. And in fact, almost exactly 70 years ago today, at the very beginning of April, 1947, a small band of economists got together in a little village in Switzerland called Mont Pelerin. 
And they decided to write what they called a neoliberal script for the economy. And they used this narrow framing that came from the textbooks to start writing the story of neoliberalism. And they did a brilliant job. There's people like Friedrich Hayek, Milton Friedman, and they used brilliant words and phrases and humor to convince everybody to believe their script. So they told us that the market is efficient, so we give it free reign, that trade is win-win, so we should open our borders, that finance is infallible, so we should trust in its ways, and that the state is incompetent, so don't let it meddle, roll back the state. Now they wrote that in 1947. They had to wait for decades for their play to actually hit the international stage. But when Mrs. Thatcher and Reagan came to power in the early 1980s, they put that play on the stage. And we've all been living this neoliberal script of what the economy is and is for ever since. We have to rewrite that narrative, take away that framing that they've given us and, and totally turn it around because we, we now understand the power of stories, the power of pictures, and we tell ourselves stories about the economy. So I'm really passionate about rewriting that neoliberal script and turning it into one of a new story for the economy. So that's the step two of the book. Love that. It's funny, I, I remember sitting next to a, a nuclear scientist on a flight and I was like, wow, you know, what do you do? He's like, I, I design, you know, nuclear submarines for the Navy. And I had him, you know, describe the entire thing to me, the whole process. And I was marveling at the fact that this nuclear submarine is just still an elaborate steam engine, right? And it was... <laughs> And I was like, oh my God, you're using, you know, fuel rods from nuclear to make steam to propel. Wow, nothing's really changed. That is really, that's, that's kind of tragic. And so right. this, and it's funny, the, the, this guy, Milton Friedman, you, you hear about him all the time. And then so I went and started looking at him as we're researching. He's very intelligent, right? But within the framework of a paradigm that is very much within the bumpers of what you're talking about here. And, and uh, most of the conscious capital leaders uh, that I've interviewed have referenced him as being one of the kind of major departures away from uh, a more holistic view of an economy that, that doesn't, you know, put the tragedy of the commons, you know, you know, at the forefront and all these other is issues. And his name has come up time and time again. This is a dude in 1947 right? Yeah. Right around where Donald yeah. Trump's haircut was invented, right? And these guys are talking <laughs> about stuff that we're now living today, right? And suffering today. So, yeah. okay. So we look at a yeah. big picture. And so how do we take this new paintbrush and start to look at something that doesn't look like a, a radiator, right? Like what, what, what does that vision look like? Is it a donut, right? Like how, what, what, how do we visualize it? Uh, do you know those little Russian dolls? The little doll sits inside the next doll, sits inside the next doll. So I think since I like playing with very uh, everyday objects, it's not a radiator. The economy is not just a radiator with money going round and round, floating on a white background. It's like a set of little Russian dolls. And in the middle, you've got these four systems of provisioning I was talking about. You've got the market, which ex which produces goods through market through monetary exchange. You've got the state, which produces goods through raising taxes and spending for public benefit. You've got the household, which produces goods within the home for those members of the family. And you've got the commons, which produces goods through those people, those commoners getting together, self-organizing and creating things they value. So four very different kinds of provisioning, all sitting together in the middle. And those are the form those are the forms of provisioning of the economy. They make up the four branches of the economy. And the economy is embedded within society, the next Russian dollar society, whether it's the political society, the institutions where, by which we elect governments who set the rules for how these different kinds of economic provisioning interact, but also the society that creates the trust, that creates the trust that we will interact with each other. We interact with strangers many times a day and all of this comes out of social trust. And then society is embedded within an even bigger Russian doll, a big mama Russian doll, which is Earth, this life-giving planet and we, on, from which the economy every day is drawing in resources, energy and matter and living materials, transforming them into things and then spewing out waste and waste heat back into the earth system. So once you do that, you put the economy in the middle of society, in the middle of earth, already we see that the economy is embedded in something bigger and more dynamic and thriving. As you were mentioning, something that grows forever becomes cancerous. It has to understand how it relates to the whole. And so we need to also think about how the economy relates to the society and the earth system on which it depends. Mm. And let's just think about finance because I haven't mentioned it. Finance, it needs to be in service to society and to the economy. At the moment, 
we all feel that we're serving finance, that financial markets will pump money and bail them out. We need to flip that around. Finance should be a service enabling economic interactions within society and within the living world. It's the beginning of a new story and we can write a new narrative. If only we had Milton Friedman on our side because he was a genius with words, but he used words to sell us a very dangerous story that's taken us to the brink of collapse. Mm. We need to use his way with words and his creativity and write a powerful new narrative that actually tells the story of the economy that we want to create. Amen. You know, it's you always think about you have to think context. 1947, World War II is over. These guys are drunk on, you know, a new society, a new way of living. Um, they hadn't really played that out to the extent where, you know, the oceans were filled with mercury. And, you know, yeah. I, presumably, I mean, this guy isn't some, you know, evil guy trying to, con you know, conceive of a way to destroy the planet. Uh, a lot of well-intentioned, smart people have had ideas that turned out to not work within an ecological framework because that just wasn't part yeah. of their paradigm yet. And I, but I like this. Yes. I, I like, you know, you're, it's almost like a ecological economics, right? It, and, and it really kind of becomes a symbiotic system of checks and balances that, that's really what's missing from that other narrative, which is more parasitic and, you know, extraction oriented, right? It's the, you know, earth yeah. is free. Yeah, because when you have that narrow diagram that Paul Samuelson drew of just the economy with money and goods going round and round, well, what would you want to do it? Well, you'd want to send more and more money, goods round and round. That's the only thing there is to do. But when you embed the economy in a richer picture and see it interacting with society in the living world, then you want to have, as you said, this symbiotic relationship about how big should the economy be in relation to society and in relation to the living world so that we all thrive. So just drawing a different picture allows us to ask a completely different set of questions. It, I, I've really learned the power of pictures to open up our questioning. It's, it's profound. You have this, uh, your third item is called Nurturing Human Nature. And, and, and before you jump into it, you know, what, what gets me is, you know, I listen to this, I hear this, and I think, okay, great, we need to rethink this and it's worth doing. And there's a significant majority of the human population that says, what the hell's the point? The rapture is coming. It's all over anyways. We're all going to go extinct. It doesn't matter. Um, it's over. Right, and that's such a beautiful narrative for the companies and the industries that are profiting off of this particular paradigm, because it means people don't care enough to, to want a change. And and you know, human nature has all these weird shunts where we kind of go off and um, forget and, and are distracted and not realize that this conversation is the future for our children's children. And so I, I just, you know, there, there are so many kind of mimetics involved in, in this bigger conversation that need to be questioned in our time. And so I'm, I'm, I'm just so happy to be ha talking to you about this. So, so what is number three? What is human nature <laughs> doing in the So human? number three, so I've talked about rewriting the narrative and redrawing the stage, the international stage on which we understand e economics. But of course we need that protagonist, humanity. And how we imagine ourselves is key. The character at the heart of mainstream economic theory is known as rational economic man. And he's been drawn down over the centuries. And as you mentioned before, it was Adam Smith who first drew his portrait. And Smith drew a very nuanced portrait. He was a smart, reflective man. He's been given a bad name through history because he understood both the importance of self-interest for making markets work, but also our interest in others for making society work. And he said this was by far the nobler and more important value for public interest, such as our sense of justice, our sense of um, generosity and altruism. So Smith had this nuanced picture, but economists who came after him and wanted to turn economics into a science, they had to pare this down because the nuance gets in the way of modeling. So they just said, we'll pluck out this self-interest part of this self-interest trait, and we'll just make that the character of economic man. So they narrowed him down and turned him into a little caricature. And his portrait is never actually painted in a textbook, but if it was, he'd have to be a little man, a little stick man, standing alone with money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head, and nature at his feet. <laughs> he hates work, he loves luxury, and he knows the price of everything and has insatiable wants. This is who economics tells us are, tells us we are. Now the trouble with it is not just that it's absurdly narrow. The real trouble is it with it is that it actually changes us when we look at it. The most fascinating research I came across was in, with economic students in the US and in Israel. The, the researchers found that the more economic students learn about rational economic man, 
the more self-interested they become. So in being told that he's like us, we actually become more like him. Now that's huge to realize that, that the portrait of ourselves that we show ourselves makes us become more like the portrait. Mm. That portrait mm. matters a great deal. So when we tell ourselves that we're self-interested, that we calculate everything, that we put our, our money first, what begins as a model of man in economic theory actually turns into a model for man. And we hear, you know, people say, well, that's not rational. If you were making your decisions rationally, we're not like that, though. And we have to discard that because we're soon going to be 10 billion people on this planet. And if we head towards that future, imagining and conducting and justifying ourselves as rational economic man, we stand very little chance of thriving together. So we need to take his old portrait down from the gallery wall and create a new one. And the wonderful thing, of course, is that a new one is being painted. It's being painted by political scientists, by cognitive scientists, by behavioral scientists who are doing actual research with humans, not creating some model out of the air, but finding out how we behave. And they're finding a much, much richer picture. We're not merely self-interested. Of course, we're interested in others. We're altruistic. We care for others. We socially reciprocate, so we cooperate with each other. And I'll punish you if you don't cooperate with me. I'd rather punish you and cut off my own nose if you, you know, if you, if you desert me. So we look for recipro reciprocity with each other. We're not calculating. We don't have little calculators in our head ever calculating the exact price of everything. We work by the rule of thumb, heuristics as it's called. And actually the rule of thumb serves us very well most of the time. We don't have fixed preferences. Economics tells us we come to the market and we have fixed preferences and we want to buy those things. Not at all. We're deeply fluid and our values, um, our values can be triggered and react, um, touched off all the time. So if I call you a consumer, you'll actually respond very differently than if I call you a citizen. So even just the words I give to how I describe you will trigger off different values in you. So we're, we're very fluid in these ways. And also, we're not dominant over nature. We're deeply dependent and embedded within the web of life. So the beginnings of this new portrait are coming through. And I think of it as the early sketches of a sort of Leonardo portrait. We've got the beginnings of it. But it's probably going to be the most important portrait commissioned in the 21st century. Because if who we tell us we are shapes who we become, we really need to care about how economics describes us. And we need to nurture the best of our nature. We can go both ways. As David Hume, the philosopher, said, in each of us lies a little of the serpent and a little of the dove. We need to tell ourselves more about how we can be savvy as the dove in order to bring that out in ourselves. So I deeply believe we can nurture our nature to be more cooperative, to be more aware of how we're embedded in the world. And this is going to give us half a chance of thriving this century. I love it. You know, what's funny is they made uh, the Wealth of Nations. I mean, he is the founding father of economics and economic theory. But his prior book, uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, was very much... Uh, tied into what you're saying here, but Bill, you know, it's almost yeah. like his words were cherry picked. I mean, poor guy is rolling over in his grave exactly. somewhere in Scotland right now. Yes, you know the. F <laughs> it, it's it's like if if you took half of Jesus's narrative and put it somewhere else and just hid it away and said this is this is all that matters, then what does that do to your your doctrine? Right? It's the same thing with capitalism. You take the founding father and you start just messing with what he's saying, um, and, and that, that that's very powerful. The 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 picture that is being painted. You know, and we're, we're mistaking the map for the terrain in a lot of ways. It's like we buy into that picture, and so it's time to draw a new picture. I, I really, I, I appreciate that. I really like that, <clears throat> that sentiment. Um, I want to get to number four. I mean, we're, we, we have uh, not enough time left because I love this conversation. Okay. I do this for days. And I want to go through your seven, and I really want to unpack them because this is important stuff. So number four is... Okay, I'll bundle a few of them together because these next three relate very closely together. Number four, in the 1870s, a small band of economists wanted to make economics as reputable as physics. They saw the genius of Isaac Newton and his physical laws of motion, and they wanted to make economics as respected as that. So what they started to do was actually imitate physics, and they tried to say just as gravity pulls an object to rest, so prices in markets pull markets into equilibrium. It was, it was a poorly chosen analogy but it seemed to work and it sounded grand. And they started drawing their diagrams just like Newton has drawn his and they started putting it in equations. They talked of the market mechanism, right? That's in all of our language, market forces, market equilibrium. This is Newtonian physics. But if the 2008 financial crash proved anything, 
It's that the idea of equilibrium is not a very good way of describing markets. They're far more like a flock of birds or a swarm of bees moving and fluctuating like this. So we need to shift from equilibrium Newtonian thinking to complexity. And we need to embrace the ideas of feedback loops and emergent trends. And then we can begin to understand the rise of the 1% or the collapse of an ecosystem. So the number four is get savvy with systems thinking and understanding those feedback loops and ditching this Newtonian idea. For economists, it means a metaphorical career change. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as engineers, looking for those levers of the economy, these market forces that you can pull on and become gardeners, realizing that actually as gardeners, there's a lot of hard work to do in the garden. It's not laissez-faire. You've got to dig, weed, prune, nurture that garden because the garden is growing organically and the gardener's job is to design it and shape it. Now, just linking to the next two ways of thinking, if we're thinking in systems, we can shape that system. It's a really empowering idea because if we're evolving, we can help evolve it. And as we all know, the butterfly can kick off the winds of change. So how do we want to design that system? Well, one of the most pernicious things that came out of this search for making economics like physics was that economists wanted to find the economic laws of motion. And there were two that have done particular damage over the last 50 years. In 1955, an economist thought he'd found a law of motion about how the economy moves in relation to inequality. He thought, he saw in the data, that as a society gets richer, first inequality has to rise and then it will fall again. And he believed this was a pattern that every economy will go through. Sounds fantastic. Guys, if, if, if things are getting more in, unequal, don't worry. It needs to get worse before it can get wet, better and growth will make it better. More growth will make us more equal. Things will trickle down to you in the end. You can already hear where those metaphors are coming from, right? Trickle down, economics, it's gonna get a lot more unequal, but then it'll trickle down and, and we'll all be better off in the end. Actually, that's just completely false. We need to design an economy to be distributive. As I mentioned at the outset, we need to make it distributive by design because things don't trickle down. Inequality can actually spiral up and up and up. It's government intervention and shaping the economy to be distributive that makes it more equitable. So we need to think of more distributive ways, not just redistributing income, but distributive ownership of wealth. Now, if that sounds radical, it's actually already happening. Think of employee owned companies. They are distributing the benefits that that company makes amongst all of the employees, not just siphoning it off for shareholders. Think of community owned renewable energy projects. That, that, that network of energy services is coming in through the solar panels and the wind farms and the benefits are being shared by the community. Think of ideas that get put in the creative commons. Rather than holding it as a patent or copyright, it's being shared and added to value. So these everyday forms of, regenerative, of distributive design are already with us and already proof that it can happen. So that was actually the sixth way of thinking is to design to distribute. Now, this, one of the next ways of thinking is to create an economy that's regenerative, because another of those laws of motion that those economists were searching for, trying to be like physicists, they believed that on pollution, we had the same story. They believed as an economy grows, pollution is going to rise. But don't worry, because after a certain point, it will fall again. <laughs> the same story. When it comes to pollution, it has to get worse before it can get better. And guess what? Growth will make it better. This promise that growth will, like a well-trained child, growth will clean up after itself. It's turned out just not to be the case. It might be true for local pollutants, but on a global scale, for carbon dioxide, for greenhouse gases, for a global ecological footprint, it's not true. We can create regenerative economies by design. And, and, and the old economics that we have is degenerative by design. We have an industrial system that takes Earth resources, makes them into stuff, we use it for a while, and then we throw it away. It's a linear through cut of the earth. We need to transform that linear process into a circular, cyclical one where we use earth's resources again and again and we re-embed ourselves in the cyclical processes of life. So just to recap those three, instead of trying to be like physicists and engineers, we need to be like God to design the garden so that it's distributive by design, sharing value created amongst those who created it by design so that we become part of earth cycles of life and instead of using resources up we use them again and again so those are three more of the ways to think i love it and and like any good gardener we know that there is no 
unsustainable growth that that continues to go. I mean, you know, I'm in the spring right now in the northern hemisphere, and my garden is, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've planted and things are starting to grow, and this is the phase. But you know, I remember pulling things just a few weeks ago, and that's part of yes. this kind of uh, ecological growth cycle and understanding that you know, uh, gr growth for growth's sake. I mean, look, look at the income disparity. Yes. You know, the the, the one percent are getting richer, and everyone else is pissed off. Yet we're all pro growth. For what and for whom? Yes, exactly. And it takes us on to the last way of thinking. Right at the end of my book, I call for us to... Now, you sound quite comfortable with that, but you and I know that that's a pretty radical idea out there in the mainstream. And I'd say it's because we have societies that have a Peter Pan attitude to growth. We always want growth. It's as if we're stuck in the growth phase of life. Because think of anything natural from your children's feet to the Amazon forest. It's healthy and natural to grow, but anything that's organic grows and then it matures and it thrives at a mature size. It's shocking to me when I look back on my own economics education that not once in my education of four years of studying economics did we ever ask whether an economy could grow forever, forever or should grow forever and what would happen if it couldn't. So the last way of thinking is to say, look, if our aim is to design economies that are distributive and regenerative, what does that mean for growth? Instead of being a goal, we've, we've dismissed it as a goal now, it becomes a response. GDP, the total value of goods and services sold in the economy, maybe it needs to go up and then it'll go level. Maybe it needs to go down and then it'll oscillate. I don't know, because we're going to go through an extraordinary transformation. Growth needs to, or GDP needs to be a response variable to the transformations we want to make. The trouble is that at the moment, our societies are addicted to growth financially, through the rate of return that shareholders demand. They're addicted politically. Every government wants to keep their economy growing because otherwise they'll get bumped out of the G20. And we're socially addicted to growth because a hundred years of consumerism has told us that the best form of therapy is retail therapy. So we need to overcome these addictions to growth and make an economy that can be agnostic about growth so that it can indeed become distributive and regenerative and meet the needs of all within the means of this planet. I love it. I mean, to me, that is the spiritual malady of humanity in a nutshell is like if we weren't focused on an unsustainable cancerous growth, then what the hell would we do? I don't know. Hang out with your children, right? Like <laughs> what is all the fuss about, right? <laughs> like have everyone be hungry, crime, go, not be hungry. Crime goes down. Uh, we could figure out better ways to coexist and we don't what, what, growth for growth's sake. Why don't we go mine the moon? Why don't we go destroy Mars while we're at it? Right. And, and so I, I love, I love the, the, the real bold, stance that you're taking with this seventh step because it's almost sacrilegious like you are such an anti-capitalist like you're going to get locked up somewhere right <laughs> <laughs> and so many people when you talk about say the idea of boundaries of pressure we should put on the planet oh no but you know growth we need to grow but i say man some of the most creative people in the world have worked with boundaries jimi hendrix he didn't ask for a 20-string guitar he just got on and did phenomenal solos within that fretboard. Mozart didn't ask for 20 octave piano. He just got more creative within the space he was in. He wasn't trying to grow the piano. He was becoming more ingenious. So when we unhook ourselves from this idea of something that needs to increase, 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 we can be creative within that space. And actually, most people's hearts come alive when they move into that creative space. That's it. And, and, and that's where our humanity lies, right? It's where there's arts, there's culture, there's all the beauty and, and all the things that we're missing while we're busy trying to make money to pay for things we don't need. I mean, come on. <laughs> it's, it, it gets a, a really ridiculous really fast. Um, look, I am so happy that you're doing this work. Um, I'm going to share your work far and wide. How can people get involved in this? How do I, you know, listening to this, I mean, obviously the first step is, it's called Donut Economics. Here's the book. Um, get the book, read the book, understand the book, and share the book, because this is a powerful reframe on all that we think that we know, right? You got to challenge the assumptions of the system that you live in or else you're just a slave to the system. And then, you know, what are, what are the next couple steps? Like, how do I move this into my life? Like, what do I need to do to okay. be better at thinking this way? Great. So first of all, when, when I say, you know, I've written a book on economics, lots of people say, oh, I don't think I'll understand that. I was never good at very math, math at school. And I'll say, look, the only numbers in my book are the page numbers. So, 
web. It's about words. It's about radiators. It's about birds. It's about all the things we've been talking about here. So I hope it's written in a really accessible way that anybody can get it and say, wow, actually, I understand the economics and damn, I'm going to be involved because I realize it's part of my world. Secondly, the idea of the donut that I've described, this, which we meet the means of meet the needs of the planet we can all imagine putting ourselves on the donut table imagine it's on the table before you and ask yourself how does the way that i shop and travel and eat affect humanity's ability to come into this donut do i have meat every day or actually am i eating more plant-based food that's going to have an impact on all sorts of planetary boundaries am i taking jet flights all over the place for the weekend or actually am i thinking more consciously about the imp impact of my carbon in life but also, it goes beyond this kind of consumerism. It's not just the pennies we spend. How does the way that I invest my money or vote or volunteer in my community or communicate with my neighbors or the language I use, all of these things help reshape the narrative. So I hope that people feel they can look at your own life and how am I involved in the commons? How am I contributing to the household? What is my role in the market and how can I reshape that? Can I create a social enterprise? What's my relationship to the state? We all are embedded in this economy and we can, like butterflies, kick off the winds of change. If people are interested in helping spread the ideas further, I've had the privilege of working with four fantastic uh, stop motion animation teams. One's in Brooklyn, one's in London, one's in Barcelona, one's in Edinburgh. And I've turned the seven ways of thinking that we've discussed briefly here today into 60 second little animations, really witty, funny, great fun and very accessible. Those are all going to be on my website from the beginning of April. And my website's www.katerayworth.com. So if anybody wants to share these ideas with their university friends, with their classroom, with their colleagues at a conference, go there and have a look at these videos. And I hope they'll make it funny and accessible. And we can all start speaking this new narrative and realize that we are creating a new economy if we put the words and pictures behind it. I love it. I love it. Rayworth is spelled without a Y. Um, R A W O R T H, and we'll put a link to it in the blog. We'll put a link to it uh, anywhere you're seeing this, just so you can get it. Um, I'm such a big fan of your work. Uh, thank you for coming back from Zanzibar and getting on the main stage. <laughs> you know, I like I, you know, I used I was up in monasteries up in Nepal, and I realized that you know the answer, the solution set to the world's problems wasn't going to be had there it was going to be you know you go back to rome to fix the empire so we have to fix this in the places we live and the places we work and you know where we dwell so i'm glad you stepped into the the world at large to to fight this fight this is this is the fight of our time right it's a it's a powerful reframe that has to happen within each of our minds before it happens in reality and like you said it's just a decision away yeah and the way i think of it is is I, I feel like the, what, the work I'm doing is one little boat in a big flotilla of boats. You're a boat in the flotilla. There's many different ships, large ones, small ones, all different shape, but we're all sailing together towards the idea of creating a new economy. And there's a wonderful network of people who are in this space. So it's great to sail alongside you. And I hope we'll cross paths again. And I hope everybody who's listening here feels inspired to realize that they are actually agents in the economy. We're all economists because we're all household managers from the very local up to the global. And we can all reshape this thing and create a thriving 21st century. And we have to, and we have to for our children, we have to. for your twins, for my kids and for their children's children. Uh, so uh, thank you so much. Um, I am uh, uh, honored. Uh, here's the book. Get the book if you haven't seen it. Uh, if, you're, if you're just on audio, it's called Dona Economics uh, and uh, last name R-A-W-O-R-T-H. Kate, thank you so much. And um, I'm looking forward. I'm, I'm going to be following you around. And I promise you this isn't the last you hear from me. I hope not. And neither okay. from me. Thank you very much Cheers. indeed. Thank you. Let me, know, let me know what you think. I'll uh, see you in the next show. Dr. Pedram Shojai, The Urban Monk. <laughs>